my client gave me a chance to show off. He asked for a conference table and told me to do whatever I wanted. A 12 foot long conference table. And the top I made for it had some issues. It could either be way too thin or a raggedy mess on the bottom side. Or it could inspire me to do something awesome. That's the story of this table. And it was a challenge that I happened to feel up to. I've seen a lot of amazing trestle style tables. And in particular, I like this conoid design made popular by George Nakashima. The joinery is literally all that holds it together. And because all these joints interlock with each other, it's incredibly sturdy. You might be wondering why this story starts here and not with milling up a bunch of rough lumber to make this base. I'll explain. In this video, I'm participating in the 2023 Rockler Try That Challenge. And the thing I've always wanted to try has to do with how I plan to fix my wonky tabletop and not with how I made this base. But any good story about making a table begins with a solid foundation. Here, you can kind of start to see the conoid shape of the table design. To say something is conoid is to say it somehow resembles a cone shape. For George Nakashima's famous chair, it referred to the angled legs and cantilevered seat. And for this table design, it refers to the legs angled outward from the center, forming lines that if you could spin them around the table would form a cone, with a point somewhere several feet below the bottom of the table. I'll tell you a few things about the table. The whole thing is made from red oak, and I cut most of the joinery with a combination of handwork with chisels or by sticking template plates to the work pieces to serve as guides for my router. All of the angles on the table are at 10 degrees to keep a consistent look. And fun fact, the original design of this table only had two legs, but because the tabletop is nearly 12 feet long, I had to call an audible and add a third leg to keep the middle from sagging. There were several small cracks and gaps that needed to be repaired while I prepped all the parts for finish. So here I'm using CA glue as well as tight bond 2 and sawdust to fill those in. Now let's get this thing glued up. I recently got this pop-up tent to serve as an outdoor paint booth. I used to paint things in a makeshift booth on the second floor of my barn, but since this space is way too long and heavy to take up there on my own, I think this will work better moving forward. I'm using black polyurethane on the base, both because I think it looks great and as a tip of the hat to Chris and Sean from Four Eyes Furniture, who have made a lot of awesome pieces using this finish. And now is as good a time as any to take a second and thank those guys, as well as Rockler, for hosting and sponsoring this challenge. I happen to pick probably the hottest day of the summer to paint this thing. So while the temperatures were miserable, my first coat cured really quickly and I was able to go ahead and sand and recoat in the same afternoon. This is where my project really started to get challenging. Epoxy has a certain reputation. Everyone seems to either love it or hate it. I haven't decided how I feel about it on a large scale, but on a small scale and when used tastefully, there really isn't a better solution for small cracks and cavities you simply can't leave in your workpiece. I'm chopping out bark inclusions here, which would eventually delaminate from the actual wood fibers, and split out of the top over time if I didn't replace them with epoxy. There were a few really small knots I just cut out with a the router. These also got the epoxy treatment. What you see me doing here is basically making a poor man's epoxy mold. Or maybe it's a lazy man's epoxy mold. I didn't really need to wrap this entire thing in melamine, so instead I'm just using caulk to block off the parts where this might leak when I pour this little epoxy lake that dangles off the edge. Mm -hmm. 
and of course, right when I need it, my cock guns empty. My client had given me one criteria to try to work into my build. We talked a bunch about the Japanese art of kintsugi. The basic English translation of kintsugi in Japanese is golden joinery. And it's most often used by these amazing artists to take broken pottery and join it back together with a gold infused paste, like a really expensive puzzle. But the basic principle of kintsugi is about embracing flaws and even highlighting them in an artful way to allow the viewer to appreciate the beauty and history of what was originally an imperfection. So as a nod to the traditional form of kintsugi, I mixed in copper metal flakes to my epoxy pores to repair these areas. And I chose copper because I think it will look better with this red oak than gold would. I did a couple of these deeper pours in two steps just to be sure I didn't have a huge leak. So here I'm topping them off after the first round cured overnight. One thing I learned about this kind of epoxy work is that if you put caulk directly on wood, it will actually stain it a greenish black color. There's at least one place on this tabletop that looks like a goose pooped on it. So far, the client has not noticed. My solution to prevent this is to put window tape down wherever I needed to build a caulk barrier wall for my epoxy. However, it's also possible that just using clear silicon instead of white caulk also works. I don't know because I'm apparently cheap and lazy. I recently picked up one of these carbide scrapers for whittling down epoxy and glue and uh, it's pretty awesome. There were several knots with pretty serious checks that I didn't want to spread out. So just as an extra insurance policy, I added a few bow ties. Here, I'm just laying them out and labeling which one goes where so I don't get them confused. I use a jig on the bandsaw to hold these at the right angle and cut them out and then clean up the edges with the chisel. My approach to installing these is to lay out tape where I want it to go, stick the bow tie down with CA glue, and then trace it with a marking knife. This leaves a nearly perfect outline for where I need to cut the mortise for the bow tie. I got this eighth inch bit specifically for cutting these out, and it really helps cut down on a lot of the tedious chisel work. It's always a good idea when tapping these in to drive it in with a block. If you hit the bow tie directly, it's possible to crack it or to shear off a corner. A little hand planing was all the top needed to be ready for sanding and finishing. Here, I'm using the sole of my plane to check for light shining through, which reveals the remaining high spots. Once I'm satisfied, I do a round of rough sanding with the Rotex using 80 and 100 grit sandpaper. And now it was time to work on the bottom side. And this is where my try that story really starts to unfold. I had to flip this thing over several times throughout the project and it never got less scary. This slab probably weighs over 200 pounds and I don't have anyone nearby to help me manage it. So many thanks to my CrossFit coaches who taught me how to lift without hurting myself. And believe it or not, the most difficult part about flipping it wasn't the task of lifting it or even jumping up like that, but actually shimming it over to the other side of my wood pile or work table. Then it was just a matter of making sure I didn't get crushed on the other side. I mentioned before that my tabletop had an issue. 
This thing was so big that I had some folks at a bigger shop in my area join and flatten the slabs for me on their big machine. Thankfully, they let me know that if they were to flatten it fully on both sides, it would end up being about an inch thick. Way too slim for a giant table like this. When they told me this, it immediately sparked an idea on how I could turn this bug into a feature. I had always wanted to try out power carving like I've seen on so many great videos. I had the tools, but not the project. So now I had a big project that would provide not only the reason to try it, but also a ton of practice with my carving discs. I'm using an extra coarse dish and fine carving disc. And I've got 6,336 square inches of this tabletop to try and see if I can keep the bottom of this table curvy. And if you're wondering how I decided where my lines should be, I honestly just drew out what felt right. The only important thing was to try and avoid cutting into the recesses that I had made for the mounting plates. My approach here is to basically use the aggressive dish to scoop out the material on either side of my lines, leaving them as little peaks. I didn't try to go super deep with this, just deep enough to make the waves visible and flow nicely into each other and to get rid of any low spots left in the slabs. I switched to the finer disc once I established the basic shapes everywhere. It was a pain to go over everything again, literally like in my back and knees and legs. But it saved a ton of time when it came to sanding this thing with a Rotex sander, which I used in Rotex mode with 80 and 100 grit, and then did a pass with 100 on orbital mode to get it relatively smooth. It was a lot of work, but when I finally had it done, I was feeling awesome about it. Well, after I slept and took some Tylenol for my knees. Once most of the rough sanding work was done, I could finally move the top inside with the help of my buddy Adam, who swung by on his way to work. Brown CA glue is awesome for filling in small cracks like this. And I think it also honors the spirit of Kintsuki in that it highlights rather than attempts to disguise these imperfections. It was super important to do all this sanding with a strong raking light so I could see the places that still had scratches from all my power carving. Sanding usually sucks, but this time I found myself enjoying it. And I guess if it felt like sculpting, that's because in a way it was. I believe it was the great Renaissance artist Michelangelo who once said about sculpting, in a lot of ways an orbital sander is really just a gentle angle grinder, and sculpting always starts with removing all the big chunks that aren't David and finishes with removing all the little chunks that aren't David. Something like that. After yet another harrowing one-man 12-foot table flip, I cut it to final length and added a 45-degree underbevel to further highlight the interesting underside of this table. Since the underbevel that I'm going to cut is a 45-degree angle, the distance that I need to overhang my track is equal to how thick I want the flat part of my edge profile to be. In this case, this 3 quarter inch setup block worked perfectly. My track saw was a little underpowered to try and dig through this cut in one pass, so I took my time and ultimately had to finish off with my Ryoba pull saw. I feel like there's a point in every project where you've gotten past most of the hard stuff and the path to the finish line becomes visible. 
each subsequent task is apparent and because of experience, how to do it is more or less obvious. I think this part of the build was that moment for me. I'm laying on final details, like cleaning up these edges with my tiny block plane, but despite being delicate work, it's no longer tedious because in a way I already feel like I've reached the summit and the remaining tasks are kind of like standing at the top and enjoying the view. But that said, it was a really long road to get to this point in the build and I still hadn't seen the top sitting on the base and I was starting to get over having half my shop taken over by this huge tabletop. Anyway, I flipped the top over again, and you just saw me spraying everything down with water to pop the grain and let it dry, and then sand through the grits up to 150 and round over the edges with a trim router. Before applying finish, I wiped everything down with mineral spirits to clean off any tiny dust particles and let it flash off. I gave the top a couple of coats of Rubio on each side and polished and buffed it up. This is just the oil plus 2C pure. I usually don't like clear finishes on red oak that isn't stained, but in this case, I think the Rubio pure's tendency to yellow things a little bit actually works nicely. Here, I'm using my Rotex and a white Scotch-Brite pad on a low speed to buff in the Rubio before wiping off the excess and allowing it to cure before applying the second coat. And I'm starting to realize that I've said Rotex a lot in this video. So sorry to anyone out there who has Festool Envy. Sorry about that. My table was finally done. Just one more thing left to do before I show it off. It's amazing how difficult things serve to motivate us. It seems like so often what we pursue in life is ease and comfort, and yet just as often those things leave us bored and discontented. But when we're pushed beyond our current abilities and given the opportunity to try new things we've never had the excuse for, or we're too afraid to attempt, we leave those experiences behind better people for having tried, whether we succeed or not. Learning and trying new things shapes us, humbles us, and creates in us a grit and resolve over time like few other experiences in life. I'm really glad I took on this challenge, and I look forward to the next one. Thank you for watching.